Okay, shalom brothers and sisters, this is Elder, Elder Rikosh, y'all the Gathering of Christ Church here with Elder Lawyer. We're going to begin again <laughs> uh, for your Sabbath, uh, fighting through these issues, okay? Uh, let's say the Hebrew credo, get the spirit in here, right? Let's go. Shema Yasha Allah Ahaya Allah Hayanawa Ahaya Akad. 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 Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Okay, fighting through these technical. Uh, issues. We're here before you with a lesson, brothers and sisters. Uh, Paul, the misunderstood apostle. Like I've mentioned earlier, uh, there's so many different variations or doctrines concerning Paul. Uh, and any, whether it be Muslims, whether it be Christians, uh, whether it be unbelievers, people always use Paul as a point of emphasis not to believe or to misunderstand the gospel of Christ, one or the other. OK, now we're going to go into it. Um, like I've mentioned earlier, years, years ago, we used to do these type of types of classes where we would prepare a lesson a little before, uh, you know, a few hours beforehand to give people edification like we did uh, uh, from Babylon, Rome to America, uh, the true name of the Most High, um, the 12 lost tribes found. And usually those particular lessons can be found uh, as far as how we do them in content within the Hebrew and Bible Academy, but it's well overdue a time for us to break down Paul. Okay? Paul, the misunderstood apostle. Now, of course, we must come through the volume of the book from Genesis to Revelations. If anyone tell you that we don't deal with Paul based on this or that, like I've mentioned, you're dealing with a deceiver because they'll, they'll produce the Bible as a point of reference and authority to back their doctrine, but yet teach others to ignore another part of the Bible when the Most High comes through the volume of the book. Let's go to the volume of the book real quick. Psalms chapter 40, verse 7. Come on. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. I come what? In the volume of the book. That means from Genesis to Revelation. Read. It is written of me. It is written of the Most High. So if someone tell you not to follow the epistles of Paul, they're deceivers. Because the most high is in the epistles of Paul. You just have to understand Paul. And that's what we hope to do today. To bring forth the full understanding of why Paul was chosen and what is Paul's ministry according to the most high. And how does that relate to us as believers? As believers, be it Israelites or Gentiles. Right? Now. We all know there was 12 disciples. Let's go there real quick. Christ chose 12 men for his ministry. That means out of all the Israelite doctrines in the earth, this there will be one particular doctrine that would lead towards the kingdom for Israelites. And through that, those Israelites will become a light to the world. Okay? These Israelites that Christ chose would be a light to the Gentiles. And through that light, they would leave their paganism and come to, to the true knowledge of the Most High God. Ahiah is his name. So, uh, Yeshia chose 12 disciples. Once Judas uh, betrayed Christ, the disciples had to choose one to take Judas's place. Now, this was well before 
Paul was chosen by Christ. Okay, there was administrative duties that, and a ministry that was allotted to Judas that needed to be fulfilled before Christ ran into Paul. Peter uh, set a meeting to replace Judas. Let's go there real quick. Acts chapter one, verse 13. Come on. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Yeshua, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Yeshua. For when he was numbered with us, he had, and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst of all, in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, and so much as that field is called in the proper tongue Al Sadama, that is to say, the field of blood. Come on. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric let another take. And his bishopric, and his bishopric let another take. Okay. So, according to the Old Testament, it, would, it was prophesied that the one who would betray Christ would be replaced. Now we're seeing the fulfillment of this. Read. Verse 21. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Yeshua went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, whose surname was Justice and Matthias. Go on. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two of them, or these two, thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Okay, he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Why? Because there were duties vacated or available due to Judas' betrayal. So they needed to replace that to do the ministry. So the disciples chose Matthias, okay, a trusted student of the disciples. But I'm going to drop this on you. Christ chose Paul. I'm going to, we're going to show it. Now, keep in mind here that once the ministry began to gain popularity, it became a threat to the authority that be, especially amongst our people. Okay. When you look at the uh, political spectrum. You had trusted Jews or Israelites who had relations or a relationship politically with the Romans and authority with the Romans. Christ did not. But Christ's ministry could not be gainsaid. Okay, so the Holy Spirit began to work with the disciples after this, subsequent to this, and many of our people began to cleave towards Christ's ministry opposed to the old way. So the Pharisees and others, our own people, charged Paul because Paul had the, the understanding of the law, 
the intellect, the, he had the intelligence, as well as the networking connections w with many rich and powerful people. He had the resources to stomp out this new doctrine, this new understanding that was bringing our people into a new way of the law. So Paul was being paid to kill off Christ's ministry. See? Paul had a connection with the Romans, with the Gentiles, with the different traitors all over the earth at this time. He had a he had political status. He spoke different languages. And mind you folks, mind you, he was being used as an enemy against Christ due to his effectiveness, his intellect, okay? His planning skills, all right? Paul was a deep brother. When I say a deep brother, that's right. It is not because I'm black I'm saying this. The original ministry, what we call Christianity, started with black Jews, beginning with Christ. There was no such thing as white European Roman Christians at this time. And so that you can't think this is my personal opinion based on my race. Let's go to the book of Acts. Acts 11, verse 26. Come on. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. Come on. And taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So you might be asking, well, what does that mean? That, that doesn't mean that they were black, right? Well, let's see how the disciples looked in Antioch. Let's go to Acts 13 and 1. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Come on. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon. As Barnabas and Simeon, and we're going to go into Barnabas a little later because he was one of the chief men or partners of Paul in Paul's beginning ministry. Who were what? And Simeon that was called Niger. They were called what? Niger. Niger. N-I-G-E-R. Black. Look it up. So the original disciples, bearers of the ministry of Christ, the beginning, all Christians were black people until the ministry to the Gentiles. Okay? Beginning with Christ. And I'm not, this is not racist. This is just, it's clear and cut. The Romans were white people. The ministry didn't start with the Romans. The modern day uh, Christianity or those who would follow Christianity would believe that uh, looking towards or viewing the Roman Catholic Church as the original church, the Roman Catholic Church they see today. Well, no, that's not true. All of those who were in the church as apostles, the teachers, were black, every last one, including Paul. A matter of fact, Paul was mistaken for an Egyptian. Let's go there real quick and read that. Acts chapter 21, verses 37 Come and on. 38. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art thou not that Egyptian? Art not thou that what? That Egyptian. That Egyptian which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers. Now, why was he mistaken for an Egyptian? The original Egyptians or the Nubians were and are black. I've been to Egypt. I know the difference between the, the Greek babies that are claiming to be uh, Egyptians. Uh, the... Uh, Arabs, the Ishmaelites who are running, running Egypt right now. I know the difference between those two 
and the original Egyptians that I've met and seen in Egypt. <laughs> See? So Paul was mistaken for what? An original Egyptian who are black people, the same way Moses was able to live in, the, in an Egyptian house. Mistaking for a black person, a white person. If they were looking for white people to kill during Moses' time in a black power structure, if a white baby was rolling on the water and came up into uh, the palace of Egypt, they would have killed that baby knowing that it was Moses. It was, it was an Israelite. Okay. Even Christ. Christ's family took refuge when Harad, a white man, an Edomite, looked to kill, an Idumean, looked to kill Christ at birth. They took refuge in Egypt. So this is no thing where we're claiming what we're racist and all that. No, the Bible is telling you that the disciples were called Niger. The Bible states this. Okay. Paul was a black man. He was a black Pharisee. He was like a paid mercenary who was paid to stomp out these black Israelites who were bringing forth the doctrine of Christ. That doctrine was opposing the status quo. It was to a point he was so effective that Christ met Paul on the road to Damascus mm -hmm. right after the murder of Stephen. Mm -hmm. See, Stephen was a great spiritual brother under the disciples who eventually they stoned and killed. They were looking to kill off the disciples. Why? Because it was destroying the political structure our people had set up in agreement with the Romans. OK. Let's go to Acts 7 and 54. Get your precepts together. Get your precepts together here. Acts 7, 54 through 60. Let's go. Acts chapter 7, verse 54. When they heard of these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of the Most High and Yeshua standing on the right hand of the Most High. Because Stephen's ministry was so effective that they had a hit out. They put a hit out on Stephen and the disciples. Okay? They put a hit, they, they would kill our brothers who were spread in the ministry and, 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 and you can come in with me, and, and, and bring it forth the true light. Our own people. This is, this is not white people here, folks. This is our people. This is black on black crime we're reading here. Okay? <laughs> this is black on black crime. It's, it's the Israelites who believe in Moses and disagree with Christ's ministry. That's what's going on here. Okay, there's no white man coming through killing black people. No, this is black on black crime we read here in the book of Acts. The Pharisees were threatened by the disciples and lied on the disciples claiming, well, they are trying to change the law of Moses and going against Moses. This is how they were able to rally people up against the true ministry. With these ad hominem attacks, these lies, claiming that the disciples ministry was against the laws of Moses. And you'll hear this same jargon amongst Israelites today who don't believe in Christ or the true ministry. Well, they're not following the law. They get because why? You will easily get people to side with you. You right? If, if you claim that they're stamping on the law, it's the law that brings us together. Well, our people were doing this back then. And guess who was the leader of them? Guess who was paying our people uh, uh, to come, come against us? Paul was. Okay. That's why so many Israelites, even back then, didn't trust him. Come on. Verse 56. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of the Most High. Yes. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Yeah. And cast him out of the city and stoned him 
And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon the Lord and saying, Lord Yeshua, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, mm. he fell asleep. Look at this. Paul. Now, at this time, he's called Saul. But this is the first look into the one we call Paul in the Bible. They killed him. And notice what Stephen said before, before, before he gave up the spirit. He asked the Most High to forgive him. They had no idea what they were doing. They were opposing themselves. The ministry that, that Christ uh, hit, the foundation he, he laid for us is the way. Okay. It is the way. We were fighting against our own freedom. We were choosing the alliances of Rome over our own kingdom and was killing those who had the ministry and the way towards the kingdom. Here's Paul now. What verse you at, Elder Lloyd? Uh, jumping over to chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to Acts 8 and 1 now. Come on. And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Come on. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Come on. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to the prison. Look at that. Anyone that was following the ministry of Christ to show you how powerful it is. Paul was charged with imprisoning and persecuting them. The Romans loved him. And guess what? The Pharisees, our people, the authority loved him. It's like having your modern day politicians or your modern day powerful pastors who would pay to incarcerate those that are teaching the true ministry today. Read. Verse 4. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So we had to, believe it or not, look behind our backs with the threat of incarceration or being killed just to spread the ministry, just to spread the gospel of Christ uh, that, was, that was left by Peter. Mm. See? Through adversity, the gospel was taught. Through threats of imprisonment by our own people was the gospel taught. So Saul or Paul was so effective, brothers and sisters, that Christ himself had to intervene. This is to understand Paul's ministry, why so many people, and the title of this is Paul, the misunderstood apostle. Just imagine having a reputation for doing all, for doing all these evil things against the righteous. And now you must go to those same people in authority, in the authority Christ sent you to bring forth a ministry that they will not readily understand. They already think something is wrong with you. You, you killed my family. You imprisoned my family. Now, not only are you coming to us, you bringing your own spin on things. That's how our brethren, the Israelites, were receiving Paul. OK. Just imagine a couple of years ago, five, ten years ago, you know, it was fear every time your name was mentioned. OK, we had to hide in houses just to teach Christ's word. And now we're supposed to trust you. So there was a mistrust or misunderstanding of Paul even back then. It didn't start in our modern time, folks. So I thought uh, the Gathering of Christ Church would put out a detailed ministry or a detailed, excuse me, message on Paul so that you can understand him, opposed to how these others who don't understand him are preferencing Paul's ministry. 
There's a lot of value we can get, a lot of understanding and spiritual understanding by the Most High we can get if, if we break down and understand why the Most High chose him. See? So now, Christ needs to intervene. No man can stop Paul. Okay? <laughs> okay? His, his purse is endless. As far as the amount of money he would be paid to destroy this ministry. Okay? <laughs> he was getting paid top dollar to, to stomp out uh, this, the new Christian faith. And guess what? Becoming quite effective at it. So Christ had to intervene. Let's go to this inter this intervention here, right? Let's go to oh. Before I go there, let's go into um, excuse me. Let's go into Paul's background real quick. Let's go to Acts twenty two real quick and get some of his background, his upbringing. Mm -hmm. Acts twenty, Acts twenty six and two. Acts chapter 26, verse 2. Yeah. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear, my, to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, known all the Jews, verse 5, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. I lived a what? A Pharisee. He lived a Pharisee, brothers and sisters. A Pharisee was a respected faction of Israelites, okay? They were the givers and the enthusiasts forcers of Moses's law. Okay? They were the giver and the enforcer of Moses's law. So if you broke the law, you would have you would have to face a council against Pharisee. The saying they were set up with the Sanhedrin, they had political status, they were the respected ministers over our people. What else you have, Elder Lord? Uh, Philippians 3 and 5. Read. Uh, in fact, verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day. He was circumcised the eighth day. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. In Hebrew of Hebrews. A Hebrew of Hebrews. As touching the law, a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee, read. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He persecuted the church, but touching the righteousness of the law, he was taught to be perfect in Christ. He transitioned, he changed. See? So there's not many people can, there was not too many people out there who can contend with Paul concerning the law. Mm -hmm. A perfect man for this ministry. A perfect man for what Christ would choose him to do. See? <laughs> Are you following me here? So he understood the law. He taught the law. A matter of fact, he enforced the law. Right? Hold that and get uh, Romans 11 and 1. So he was from the tribe of Benjamin, a stock of Israel, a teacher of the law, a Pharisee. Right? Hold that. Okay, because in the spirit, you know, I'm getting things are coming to me. So I'm just going to just go go with it. Okay. Hold, hold Romans 11 and let's get... Um, Christ's words, Matthew 23 and 1. St. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. Yes. 
Then spake Yeshua to the multitude and to his disciples, this saying, This is Christ, read. The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So this give you, I'm giving you a description of Paul's title. See? They sit, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. See? Moses was the leader, the giver of the law. And guess what? If you broke the law, he could, with one word, give a punitive death penalty. Okay? That's power. Well, guess who had that power against the church at one time? Paul. Against his own people who believed in Christ. Who had that power to kill Israelites, to imprison Israelites. He would... Open up Moses' law and says, this is what you Christians are breaking. This is what you are breaking according to Moses' law. And here's the judgment according to this law. Imprison them. Kill them. That was the power of Paul. Read. Verse 3. All therefore whatsoever they bid you, observe. He says, observe. Read. That observe and do. Read. But do not after their works. But don't do after their works. Why? For they say and do not. Because they were hypocrites. OK, they weren't enforcing the Most High's law according to righteousness. They were they were in league with the Roman power. They were hypocrites. OK. Here it is. Paul. A doer of the law, a Pharisee claiming that he's cleaning up Israel, uh, uh, cleaning up Israel based on this new ministry that's tainting Moses' law, became a murderer of his own people, right? Hold that, I'm just, now, now look at Romans 11 and one now. Romans 11, verse, verse one. Read. I say then, have God cast away his people? Have God cast away his people, read. God forbid. God forbid. So Paul is writing here in Romans, the Israelites are not done away with him, but the point I wanna get out of this it's what Paul says about himself, because we will revisit this a little later. Read. For I am also an Israelite. I'm a what? For I am also an Israelite. Israelite is not a religion or a belief, folks. Israelite is a national origin. It's, it's your nation. It's your bloodline, your genealogy. Okay? That's what Paul was. So when someone asks and uh, are per perplexed, with the word Israelite, when you mention you are an Israelite, that shows their ignorance uh, uh, in relation to the Bible. The Israelites are from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> Paul says, I'm also an Israelite, read. Of the seed of Abraham. Of the seed of Abraham. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Of the tribe of Benjamin. He, he stated his tribe and nation a chosen seed of Israel, okay? The people today, Europeans that are claiming to be Jews are not from any of the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? Period, they're Romans, period. Well, here's Paul stating his nation and tribe. Like for instance, you ask a Negro in America, well, who are you? They'll say, I'm black or African-American or I don't know or I'm African. When the Bible never named any of the nations in the Bible, any people from Adam were called Africans. Hmm. As far as nation goes. Now, of course, Paul was mistaken for an Egyptian. Why? Because they're black. But Egypt is Montazarium, which is who? A son of Ham. <laughs> See? That has a national origin according to the Bible. But when you ask black people, well, who are you? They're like, I'm a slave, I'm black. African American, all these words that God never gave us. But now we can state plainly, like Paul, oh, I'm an Israelite. 
according to bloodline, the prophecies states that these particular people would go into captivity. We are those people, predominantly Judah, Benjamin, and Levi were in the transatlantic slave trade. If you're in uh, America, the slave trade in America, there's a great chance that you're from Judah. You would state that I'm from, I'm an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. See? Well, Paul is stating his national origin. He's an Israelite. So when someone claim it doesn't matter who you are and try to use Paul's writings, you can respond back with, if it, didn't, if it doesn't matter, who you are, according to Paul's writings, why did Paul state that he was an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin? <laughs> if it didn't matter, right? So now, we understand Paul, an Israelite, a Pharisee, had a task to do what? To stomp out the ministry that was left to the 12 disciples. Now, Christ intervened. Let's go. The book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 1. Yes. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. So he, he, he was, he was, he, he was dealing with threats of killing the disciples. It was all out there. If I find them, they're dead. Now, just imagine this, brothers and sisters, real quick. Just imagine... An Israelite that's against the New Testament. And you agree that we're the people in Deuteronomy 28. Right? The people who went into captivity. And you respect the laws of Moses whence we fell. And an Israelite come to you and show all the evil things that Paul did to our people. Initially, if you don't have no understanding of the Bible, you'll be turned off by Paul. I can't believe anything he said. So a lot of us are introduced into the truth with these particular teachers. Who will go in and just show you. There's, this is where Paul lied at. This is where he deceived that. This is where he killed that. Guess what? Paul never hid from any of the negative things that you know, he, he admitted. He was once an evil and wicked man. Mm. He admitted that. But they'll point this out as a point of claiming that you cannot believe or, or, or follow any of Paul's teachings. That's deception in itself. Because which one of us didn't do evil before the understanding of the Most High? What makes you so perfect that you can point out a man that was wrong and now use it as a pretext to say don't listen to him? Well, we shouldn't listen to anyone then because everyone did wrong. See, <laughs> why should we listen to you? Suppose somebody pull out all your baggage you don't want to admit. At least Paul admitted it. But there's another reason why they don't want to deal with Paul. And I'm going to go there a little later. It be the, the most high's will this Sabbath. We're going to knock out every area. Possible. Where Paul is mostly uh, misunderstood. Okay. So Christ comes to Paul. Christ don't come to kill Paul. Or destroy Paul. He come, Christ came to actually show Paul himself. And how he was. Paul himself was fighting against his own salvation. His own kingdom. See. Let's go. Verse 2. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as many as journeyed, he came, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, So he was on him, his way to kill some disciples. <laughs> <laughs> Shouting and cursing, saying, I'm going to, why? Because regardless of, uh, of the persecution, the disciples were fervent in spirit. They were tasked 
to do this unto death. Which only infuriated Paul more. So here it is. He's on his way to try to, you know, go against more of us, more, more of those who believe in Christ. And now Christ intervenes. He's on his way through the road of Damascus and he a, a great light is before Paul now. Read verse four or verse three. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Come on. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why are you persecuting me? Why? Because those that are baptized into the ministry are a part of Christ's body. It's one body, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Why are you persecuting me? <laughs> okay. I'm throughout the church. I'm, I'm the spirit behind this ministry. You are persecuting, attacking, imprisoning. See? Why are you persecuting me? Read. Verse 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? He says, Who art thou, Lord? Read. And the Lord said, I am Yeshia of whom thou persecutest. Mm. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. It's like you're kicking a rock. It, like, it, it, don't you? This is an un. You cannot win this. Mm. Okay? <laughs> he didn't kill Paul for this because he knew Paul was ignorant. To what he was doing. He knew Paul had, because why? Paul was a fervent believer in the law. He believed that according to the law, the right thing to do was to punish those who were opposing the established Pharisee. Okay? His zealousness is what Christ would use to do the contrary. Instead of destroying the Most High's people, he would be used to build them with that same fervent tenacity, that zealousness. Read verse six. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? So eventually he seen Christ show, showed him Exactly, brothers and sisters. Exactly what he was fighting against. Okay. Brothers and sisters, Christ took him. That whole time period, that whole thing that was going on, Christ took him and showed him most, mostly everything. What would happen, the kingdom that would come, uh, 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 he also showed him what was happening in the earth as far as judgment and all that. What the penalty, the penalty he would have to deal with after death. If he continued to fight against his people, Paul was shown it all. He was taken up unto the third heaven. How do I know this? Let's go there to the third heaven in Corinthians real quick. Fourteen years into the ministry, Paul wrote this to the church of Corinth. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse one. Come on. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the, of the Lord. Verse two. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. He says he knew a man. Why? Because he was born again. He's speaking of himself, the man that used to be Saul, who eventually became Paul. He knew a man, read, whether in the body, I cannot tell. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. This is what happened in that intervention on the road to Damascus. 
whether in the body I could not tell. Read. Or whether out of the body I cannot tell. Whether I cannot tell. Read. The Most High knoweth. Only the Most High knoweth. That means his spirit was taken. It was a phenomenon beyond the regular laws of this earth. He says, in the body or out of body, I cannot tell. This is what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus, folks, that made him repent, that made him ask Christ, what can I do? Read. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. He was caught up to the third heaven, folks. Christ showed him everything. So his the men around him heard one thing, but he heard and seen many things. I'm going to go there in a moment. Read. Verse 3. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Come on. The Most High knoweth. Only the Most High knoweth. Read. Verse 4. How uh, that he was caught up into paradise. He was caught up into paradise. So Christ also showed him paradise. He showed him the kingdom the disciples were fighting for and dying for and laying down their lives for. He showed him what he was fighting against. Why you kick against the pricks? This is your kingdom you're fighting against. Read. Read. And heard unspeakable words. And heard unspeakable words. Which it is lawful, not lawful, for a man to utter. Come on. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine affirmities. But in mine affirmities. There's many things he could have he uh, told people. But he kept it on what? The level of the ministry. Certain things he told people, certain things he, that Christ told him to keep for himself. A lot of the information of what was shown to Paul is in a record called the Apocalypse of Paul. Okay. After his death, the record was found. It was through what Christ showed him on the road to Damascus that led him to repent for his evil against the children of Israel and began a ministry. An apostleship given to him by the by by Yeshua, Christ, the Savior. Let's go back to uh, Acts nine. Acts chapter nine, verse six. And he trembling and astonished said, "Lord, what will thou have me to do?" He says, "Lord, what you going to have me do? What can I do now?" Read. And the Lord said unto him, "Arise and go into the city." And it shall be told thee what thou must do. Come on. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless. And the men that journeyed with him stood speechless. Read. Hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Right. So I'm going to show you where some people who don't believe in Paul go to to claim there's a contradiction here. Now. Where I'm going doesn't contradict Christ meeting Paul on the road to Damascus. <laughs> so when someone go here for a contradiction, first start with where both of the verses agree. So if they try to, if they try to look at words and parse words and say this is that these this is a contradiction, and that means Paul's writings uh, uh, has no credibility. You have to come back and say, well, do you agree in both of the verses Christ spoke to Paul? <laughs> okay. Do you agree with the ministry that both of the verses agree on concerning Paul's ministry? Because that's what, what's important. <laughs> Christ's words to Paul. See? Now, I'm going to show you where they go to claim contradiction and give you the precepts to destroy this lie they've put out there concerning Paul for those who don't believe in Paul. Okay. This is the first place they'll take you. Read. 
Uh, Acts chapter 22, verse 6. They'll say there's a contradiction or discrepancy between Acts 9 and Acts 22. Right? Because in Acts uh, 9, it reads, let's get the night. Yeah, yeah, make sure we hold them. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 9, verse 7. And the men which journeyed with him stood. The, the men who were with Paul stood speechless, hearing a voice. They but, heard a voice. But seeing no man. But seeing no man. So they say, they'll read that. And guess what? Usually you'll see this in Muslim books. It's Muslims who have books to try to question or contradict the Bible. But you have Israelites who don't believe in Paul who would use these, uh, 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 these particular contradictory type of teachings to discredit their own book, <laughs> right? Let's go to Acts, right? You in 22, right? Yes, sir. Let's read seven. Acts 22 and seven. And I fell into the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Same as the, the ninth chapter, read. Verse eight. And I answered, who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Yeshia of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with, with me saw indeed the light and were afraid. But they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. It's, see, but in this chapter, it says they heard not the voice that spake to him. But in the ninth chapter, it says they heard a voice. Right. So how do you break this down? Well, that voice can be interpreted as what? Noise. They both heard the noise or the thundering and all the different sounds that came with the light, both Paul and the men that were with him. But Paul was able to hear Christ speak directly to him through it, and they couldn't. Okay, so that's how you break that down. There was, there was thundering and all types of noise. But they can only hear certain parts of it. Paul heard distinctly Christ's voice through it. Let's get the precepts on that to prove that. Yes, sir. This is Acts chapter 26, verse 14. Because that word voice breaks down to a Greek word, phone. Okay. That phone, let's get, let's get that in the Greek real quick, Elder Lord. Mm -hmm. Let's get that right here in the Greek here. Yeah. You have it? The water. In fact, I'm going to get your voice. Yes. It's five, four, five, six, right here. Right. The Greek word phone, five, four, five, six. It says, through the idea of disclosure, a tone. A tone. Articulate, bestial, or artificial. So Read. if I could just go into go. that, articulate meaning in an intelligible language, a distinct language, or it can be bestial, just a noise, a sound. Exactly. It could be either or, a sound or a voice. So both happen simultaneously. Paul was able to hear Christ's voice through it. They weren't. Okay. Go on, other lawyer. By implication and address for any purpose, saying, or language, noise, sound, voice. Noise, sound, voice. Okay, so when you go into either of these, when it comes to voice, ninth chapter and the 22nd chapter, you will have noise for voice and you will have language for voice. <laughs> See that? So yes, they heard the noise and thundering, but they didn't hear what Christ was saying to Paul. Mm -hmm. And we have precepts that will give you understanding to that. Go on, Elder Lloyd. Acts chapter 26, verse 14. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me 
and saying in the Hebrew tongue. In the what? In the Hebrew tongue. See, those men didn't hear the Hebrew tongue. They heard the noise. See, they heard the thundering. So the same time, everyone is hearing all this noise and commotion due to this intervention here. Paul is being taken into the third heaven. Out of body or in the body, he cannot tell, hearing exactly what Christ is telling him what he's doing. And what he is to do based on his actions to, against the church. See? <laughs> Are you following me here? Go on, other lawyer. Saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So that's how you break this down. Now let me give you some precepts to kill that contradiction. Let's go to that with the word noise. Acts 26 mm -hmm. and 13. Acts 26 verse number 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me saying, Paul says he heard a voice speaking unto him saying, read in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Come on. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And what verse you left off at? Uh, that's verse 14. Go down to the 16th verse. Read all the way to the 16th. Verse 15. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Yeshia whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. For this purpose. What purpose? Read. To make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. See that? So he was shown many things. He was shown what to do, all of that. Who to deliver it to? It all during that same period, right? Mm -hmm. Now, while they were hearing the noise, Christ was just filling Paul with information, right? Now, let's go to Daniel's 10, 7, and 8, giving some precepts on this noise. Mm -hmm. uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 7. Yeah. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. See that? The same context. You can have men around in the same space who will see something, but not exactly what the Most High is showing the particular prophet or teacher. See? Read. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them. See that? A great quaking fell upon them, similar to what happened with Paul. Read. So that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned into corruption, and I retained no strength. Now, that's an example, brothers and sisters, of what? All people in the same space, be it hearing or seeing something differently. Mm -hmm. See? So the most high can focus on one person and have it where all the people around you can see one thing while the one person see clearly what the most high is showing. It's the same with hearing. Mm -hmm. Go on, other lawyer. Yes, sir. Last precept, St. John chapter 12, verse number 28. Yes. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying. Another example. I have both glorified it and will glorify it glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. So they thought it thundered. <laughs> Read that again. Here's another precept you can use for that spiritual intervention. Okay? With Paul. Mm -hmm. So the spiritual intervention is when the voice and the instruction is given to one man while everyone around is hearing something else. Mm -hmm. Read it. John 12 and 28. Father, glorify thy name. 
Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said, It thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Yeshia answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Exactly. You see that? So all in all, they heard one thing, but the voice was to one. Mm -hmm. Now let's go back to Acts 9. To show what the ministry of Paul uh, or what Paul was instructed to do based on this. Mm -hmm. Now, now, mind you, brothers and sisters. OK, this is what I want to emphasize. This is how the, you have to understand when people are coming to you with these contradictions is not to edify, but to confuse. Because you begin to focus on what they call a contradiction and not the message from heaven. What's more important? <laughs> See that? That's the devil work like that. They will come in and say, well, I'm not going to deal with Paul because it says this here and this there. There's no contradiction. Brother, you need a teacher. That's all. No, so it's not like some. It's like this, brothers and sisters. You can't claim something is wrong simply because you don't understand. And that's what's going on amongst these brothers. The majority of people don't understand Paul and are, and are too prideful to admit it. So if they run into Paul's writings and it contradicts their upbringing and teaching, automatically they'll look for information to discredit Paul. What's more important? Whether or not these guys around Paul heard it or the ministry that was given to him. Now, check that out. Straight deceivers. And the majority of people that I see come up against Paul know nothing of him. Like, it's interesting that you're breaking down Paul to me and you're trying to show me certain things. Uh, give me some insight on your study on Paul. Mm -hmm. What did he grow up learning? Where did he live? What happened leading up to this contradiction you're going into. And they'll look at you dumbfounded. Why? Because they're only teaching you what their unlearned teacher taught them. They never really studied Paul for themselves. See? <laughs> now let's finish reading and, and because there's a lot I want to cover uh, within this last hour. Go on. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. Yes. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And have seen in a vision a, a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he have done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Look, even Ananias <laughs> had issue at first because, you know, Christ was showing Ananias, and, you know, he was like, listen, I need you to receive this man. Ananias was like, you're dealing with a man, Christ, of reputation. His reputation is against you and the ministry. <laughs> right? Come on. Verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he have done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Come on. And here he have authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. He have authority by the chief priest to imprison all that call on the name of Yeshua or Christ. Yeshua is savior. Some people say Yehoshua. Some people say, say Jesus, but his name is savior. A matter of fact, uh, the other day, Elder, Elder Gabar sent me an old document that was found 
on papyrus papers. Okay. A fragment that showed in Hebrew, my savior, pertaining to how they were addressing or teaching Christ in the New Testament. They found a fragment. I'm going to introduce that soon. They were calling him savior, my savior. That's Yeshua. His name is not Joshua. It's Yeshua, Yeshua. But go on. Verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. And Paul, I mean, uh, uh, Christ told Ananias, go thy way. Okay. For he's a chosen vessel unto me. We, I'm going to need you to put that, that view you have of Paul away. Okay. He will repent. He, he has repented for his evil against the church. Read. He's a chosen vessel unto me to do what? To bear my name before the Gentiles. To bear my name. What? Before the Gentiles. Before the Gentiles. Read. And kings. And kings. And the children of Israel. And the children of Israel. So that means Paul would have a ministry not just like Peter had to go only to Israelites. He would have to proclaim this ministry to kings, Gentiles, to everyone. Why? Because he already had networking and relationships with them. He can get into places that Peter couldn't. And for those who are claiming that these Gentiles are Israelites, read that again. Verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name. To bear my name, Yeshua, read. Before the Gentiles. Before the Gentiles, that means non-Israelites. And kings. And kings. And the children of Israel. That's the children of Israel. So, so anyone claim that all of the Gentiles Paul were teaching were Israelites in a Gentile state of mind, that's straight deception. Because those Israelites right there, that it says at the end, includes those Israelites that are in a, in a Gentile state of mind. Mm -hmm. Israelites are Israelites. Okay. Now, yes, Paul did teach Israelites who were in a Gentile state of mind and brought them back to what? The understanding of their commonwealth. He did. And that's where a lot of Gentiles get confused. I'm going to get there in a moment. They get confused that with some of the information or the doctrine that was being taught to those Israelites and believing that that information pertains to them. That's where they're getting confused. Because Paul did speak to Israelites in a Gentile state of mind too. But he made a distinction when he was speaking to them or natural Gentiles. Okay? But getting back to the point, Christ told Paul to do what? Read. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. So we know in that noise that was going on when Christ was speaking to Paul, he was telling Paul, I'm going to need you to go to those same Gentiles that sent you to destroy my people. I need you to go to them and tell them this. See? Read. And kings. And kings. The same kings that are against my kingdom. I'm going to need you to go to them and tell them this. Read. And the children of Israel. And you go to the children of Israel. When you run into my people, you tell them this. See? So he had three distinct missions in one. <laughs> Why? Because it was based on the relationships. The Most High raised him from birth to one day deal with this ministry. See, he, he understood many languages. 
He understood the law of Moses and he had political affiliations throughout the earth. See? So Christ is going to use that now. So the same man that was sent to destroy the church, Christ would use all those attributes to add to it. That would add to the church. Are you following me here? So when you see Paul teaching to the Gentiles, you would have Israelites who don't understand it fully. And they'll look at that and say, that's wrong. You shouldn't be teaching those Gentiles. Right? When you see Paul strictly dealing with Israelites, Gentiles will look at it and say, that's wrong. He was sent to us. <laughs> right? So we're going to bring you some resolve for this today. Only a few more. Paul, the misunderstood apostle. Paul started setting up churches. He linked up with Barnabas. Right. And began to set up churches. Eventually, him and Barnabas uh, had a disagreement and Barnabas set his ministry uh, separate from Paul, but still. He was doing exactly what Paul taught him. Right. So Paul became an apostle. Let's get that showing you that he's the least of the apostles. Right. I got it here. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 15. Right. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 15, verse nine. Read for I am the least of the apostles for I am the least of the the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle. But yet it's not meet to be called an apostle at this time because I persecuted the church of God. So even though he was acting in a role of the, an apostle. Chosen by Christ, just like the other 12, right? The other 11, because Matthias was chose through lots. Christ chose Paul. It says, for I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. At that time, before his work was at, at, at the full, he was not acknowledged as one of the apostles based on reputation. But his work says otherwise. <laughs> okay. Read. Verse 10. But by the grace of the Most High, I am what I am. But by the grace of the Most High, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. It was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. But I labored more than all the apostles. Why? Because the same way Christ gave the disciples their mission, he gave Paul his mission. And Paul labored unto the death. OK, and guess what? It, 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 and it was through adversity. When he says, listen, he prayed three times to take this thing from him, this thorn in the flesh. Well, guess what? He was shipwrecked. He went through all types of things he had to persevere through just to teach the ministry. And Paul would pray that this thing be taken from him. He used to deal with the guilt all the time throughout his whole life of the ministry. He dealt with the guilt. Of destroying God's people. Of seeing Stephen de there dead in front of him with his clothes strolled before him. After seeing a prophet of the Lord say, Lord, forgive Saul. Forgive Paul. Forgive them. Paul was there. So Paul would pray that the Most High would take these thoughts and all that from him. He had to live with this, you know, 
his mission against the kingdom. He had to live with it every day. It became a thorn in the flesh. Okay. Now, finish reading what you have there. Yes, sir. Verse number uh, 10. But by the grace of the Most High, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of the Most High, which was with me. Read. Therefore, whether it was, whether it were I or they. Whether it was me or them. Read. So we preach, and so ye believe. We all preached, and now you believe. Paul was setting up churches everywhere. OK, it was to a point where Peter himself had to acknowledge. His apostleship. Right. Who could break down Paul? I mean, uh, the ministry of Christ and Paul's ministry more so than Peter himself, because there was an argument or a dispute at this time concerning the circumcision. Which means if you do convert them into the church, into this ministry, that man, according to the law, must be circumcised. Heathens are uncircumcised. So there was dispute on whether or not Paul should circumcise people, people in the church that were being converted. Now, Peter was sent chiefly to what? The circumcision. Let's get that real quick. Uh, this is Galatians chapter 2. Verse number, I'll start in verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. The Most High accepteth no man's person. Come on. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrariwise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me. So the gospel of uncircumcision, to go to the people of uncircumcision, was committed to who? Paul. Read. As the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. And the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. So let me break this down, brothers and sisters. The circumcision represents the Jews or Israelites that were under the law. See? So Peter was given a mission in Matthew 10, him and the disciples, to only go to Israel. So they didn't have to worry about circumcising the men who were converted. These people were already physically circumcised. See? Paul was sent to the uncircumcision, and now they would frequent the church with the circumcised. And you would have our people looking at these people like, I know that this person was dealing with this temple and didn't uh, uh, circumcise the foreskin of their flesh, according to our father Abraham. So you had these people in the church now bringing up word against the uncircumcised. Like, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it together. Y'all got to, you have to at least show a commitment to do what our father did. Right? Read. Verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. See that? The same was mighty in him towards the Gentiles. Why? Brothers and sisters, don't forget this, okay? Yes, we're Israelites. But a kingdom is not a kingdom unless, unless all people are included. We're not going to be ruling ourselves. <laughs> okay. So Paul had to teach the way in which the Gentiles would have a part. 
in the kingdom to come and what part they would play. They wouldn't be the head anymore, but they would still have a place as subjects in Christ's kingdom. Now, if we don't teach it to them, how will they learn it? How will they rehearse the righteous act and prepare their children for Christ's kingdom? Peter wasn't taught to do that initially. He was taught to only deal with those who knew the laws of Moses. So Paul had that as part of his ministry. Now, the great thing about Paul is he was a Pharisee, so he could do what Peter was doing, too. <laughs> See, but he also had an understanding. On what to teach the Gentiles, Christ showed him that eventually Paul and Peter had a meeting. Paul explained to Peter what Christ told him on the road to Damascus. And they begin to understand and not get in either, either one's way. See? <laughs> Are you following me here? Now, mind you, Peter is that rock Christ built his church. All right? It's that ministry that Paul had to learn, actually, from Peter. But Paul had the access into doors Peter didn't. And Christ had Christ's word would go throughout the earth. The kings, the Gentiles, the Israelites, his word would have to go throughout everyone. And Paul was the perfect vessel for this at that time. See? Now you... This is what I need you all, brothers and sisters, real quick to ponder on. Isn't this understanding of Paul more interesting than ignoring him altogether based on some so-called discrepancies that they claim is discrepancies between two verses? <laughs> Instead of just being dismissive and say, well, I'm not going to deal with it because I don't understand it. Isn't this more interesting? Now, on the another thing, doesn't this allow us or give us space to appreciate the mercy of the Most High and the grace of Christ? Where this man who did evil had an opportunity to bring forth Christ's kingdom, to do what's right in the earth. Does, isn't that an example we can all draw from? <laughs> Finish what you got, Elder Lloyd. Yes, sir. Verse 9, Galatians 2 and 9. Yes. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. That we should go unto the heathen and they go un and, and they unto the circumcision. So they made an agreement. We'll go to the heathen, you go to the circumcision. And see, and that's why living in a Gentile world, the Gentile church is more so swayed towards Paul's writing as authority. But the mistake they make is to view Paul's ministry over Christ's teachings. Okay? They'll deal with Paul understanding only when Christ had Paul's teachings and Peter's teachings. And they all led to the same place. So that's what's wrong with Gentile churches today. We'll go into the law and the understanding of it and the foundation of it according to Pete, what was given to Peter and they'll jump right into the epistles saying, no, that's a contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction. You weren't taught the ministry to Peter too. So you're confused. That's all. <laughs> when we bring up the law in Israelites and 
and, and, and the, uh, the workings of the law according to Christ. We're not doing that to, uh, uh, to, 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 to say that you, as a Gentile, is without anything. And that's and originally, that's how they take it. When you go into the law and, and the ministry to Israel, automatically a Gentile is taught to believe that they're not included. <laughs> if you talk about the law in Israel, then that's against us. And automatically they shut down. And they will cleave to Paul's writings because at least they know Paul had a ministry for them that included them. But they ignore other parts of Christ's ministry, which is an error on their part. But we're going to clear that up in a moment. Right? Now. There's five in particular. That we're going to end this with, right? Some real good stuff. Five places in particular, right, where you will see anti-Paul sentiments. Unbelievers, Israelites that only believe in the law and look to execute the law of the Old Testament like the Pharisee Paul was before his conversion, before Damascus. Well, you still have Israelites there that are against the ministry of Christ, that are against the apostles of Christ, and that's against uh, uh, the structure of the New Testament path. So they attack Paul because Paul was them, and they feel that he's he's a traitor to his primal origin. Even Jewish people today claim that Paul was a traitor in their doctrine. And they claim that Christ was a traitor to, to the Mosaic law in their doctrine, right? So we have unbelievers like Muslims. And I would never have a Muslim come and try to break down what's wrong in the Bible, because why? They don't believe in it. <laughs> so what can you tell me about anything as if you went into the Bible for righteousness? You went into the you went into the book, a book you didn't believe and went into it totally to discredit it. So so you you are Muslims are off the table. Okay, there's nothing they can teach us about a Hebrew book, an Israelite book. They're Arabs, okay? Next. Unbelievers, we're going to show you why they're anti-Paul. Israelites that only believe in the Old Testament. And you can include those who say, well, I believe in the Old Testament and the, and, and the Gospels. But I don't follow Paul. Include them in the Old Testament bunch, all right? Three, you have women who seek status in the church as anti-Paul, and we're going to show you why. Okay. And we have Gentiles who misunderstand Paul. Well, we're going to go down each of these and show you why. One moment. Stay tuned. i 
Okay, jumping right in, okay, Paul, the misunderstood apostle, one moment, Okay, jumping right in, Paul, the misunderstood apostle. Let's first start with why he's misunderstood, according to the book of Peter, right? Now, unless you understand his ministry that was given to Paul, you'll be caught up in the noise, <laughs> mm. right? You'll be stuck in the noise the same way the men around Paul heard the noise, but they didn't hear the mission. So if you don't understand the mission and focus, if you don't focus on what Christ told Paul to do, you'll get caught up in the noise and won't understand. He told Ananias, to, uh, one of the one of his prophets at that time that he told Paul to bear witness of his gospel and his name to the kings, Gentiles, and Israelites. Right? To bear his name. See? Now, let's go to uh Peter's real quick. Read it, chapter and verse. Second Peter 3.15. Now, mind you, Peter, brothers and sisters, boom. Peter is the man Christ established his church upon. So a lot of people didn't understand Paul. Peter did. See? So you can't say, well, I believe in the Gospels. Uh... 
uh, of, of Christ, but yet I reject Paul's writings. Well, you reject Peter, who's the pillar for the gospel, if you do so. Read what it says in the book of Peter. Second Peter 3.15. Yes. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, have written unto you. Come on. If I can mention real quick, yeah. notice Peter did not say the false apostle Paul or the enemy of the church Paul. He said our beloved brother Paul. He was a beloved brother of the apostles. See? A respected laborer in Christ's vineyard. Read. Verse 16. And also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Paul, even Peter says, Paul teachings are hard to be understood. Mm. So first of all, it's certain areas that you have to actually study to get the understanding on. It doesn't mean that Paul's writings are incorrect because it don't align with your doctrine. And that's what's going on out there. Read. Which they that are unlearned and unstable The rest. people who didn't study Paul based on the ministry given him. Read that last piece again. In which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned. They which are unlearned. So we're not attacking people. You, you understand? When we say that the people that don't, that don't understand Paul is unlearned, we're not attacking people. Their, their intellect. The Bible tell you they're unlearned. They haven't studied Paul. They took someone's word for it and never really went into the ministry of Paul. Read. And unstable. And they're unstable. Read. Rest. So that rest is they wrestling. When Paul's writings come up amongst them, they wrestle with it because why? They feel it's infringing on their understanding, the doctrine they have taught. So they wrestle with Paul's writings. It's hard to be understood by them. So they just discredit it or claim Paul was a false apostle. See? <laughs> and guess what? I don't care how great they hear are that, that, that make these claims. Or, or look to assassinate Paul's character. Doesn't matter how great their beards are. Doesn't matter how many fringes they wear and how well spoken they may seem in teaching the Bible. It doesn't matter none of that. They're still unlearned. It's an area they have ignored, that they're ignorant to. See? The best thing to do if you don't know something or haven't really studied it is to just leave it alone. Don't say anything contrary to it because you don't understand the work of the Most High in it. See? Don't discredit it. Because, and, and, and guess what? A lot of these guys that I say that speak against Paul, again, know nothing of him. The only thing they know that if they were to accept certain information, it would infringe on what was taught to them. That's all they, they understand. Read. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. So they'll wrestle with Paul's writings. Read. As they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. And then because they're trying to attack Paul, they'll begin to misinterpret other verses and not rightly divide the word to, of truth to their own detriment. OK, there was disagreement during Paul's time, even with the apostles, but they didn't outright discredit him or just say, don't follow him and get away from him. He's false. They set a meeting to, you know, to give some for edification. They sat there like, listen, he's doing something that's well beyond the norm of what we were taught to do. But why did Peter respect that? Because before Paul did anything, he was a, he was amongst a man. 
that came and was well out of, out of the parameters of what came before him. Christ. So Peter was like, well, OK, it's causing some disruption here. A lot of people don't understand. But this is how Christ works. <laughs> so we're not going to discredit him. We're going to figure out what Christ told him. What is the reason? And when Paul broke it down, Christ, then Peter was like, well, now I understand. Because first Christ told us to only go to Israelites. But after Christ's death and resurrection, he told us to go throughout the four corners of the earth. Teaching and baptizing all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the last thing he told us. Well, here's a man who used to go against us that's for us now. Who's doing the same exact thing Christ told us, the disciples, to do in private. <laughs> see? He's like, oh, see, now I'm seeing it. See? So it wasn't, well, look what Paul doing. He used to kill us and this, that. No. Peter was looking beyond just the flesh and the emotions of Israel. Peter was given the full mission. So was Paul. See? So it's the unlearned that get caught up in the emotions of things. Well, look at this contradiction here. He heard the voice here. Did he hear the voice here? <laughs> unlearned. Mm. That's a child. That's a baby right there. I don't care how, how many grades they have in their beds. That's a baby. Okay. Now, let's go into it now. Unbelievers. This is why unbelievers, chiefly, let me, let me tell you, when it comes to, to doctrinal opposition, you will, you will find no religion more opposed to Paul than Islam. Why? Why? Because Paul make it clear in his epistles that the Most High is for his people first. And he calls out Muslims or Arabs who are against the gospel. He calls them out. And that's why Islam focused on discrediting Paul. They came out with this false book called the book of Barnabas. If the book of Barnabas was true, the Bible would have referred us to the book of Barnabas. Okay? The Bible says, isn't it written in the book of Jasher? The Bible tells us about the testimonies of Enoch, that he left a testament. It's already proven that the book of Barnabas was a, pla a, a straight plagiary a lie that came up hundreds of years after Barnabas was already dead. It's already been proven. But, but Muslims will pull out the book of Barnabas. Why? Because the Bible gives us de detailed information or detailed uh, insight on a relationship Paul had within the Bible. They needed someone with credibility who, who was loosely connected with Paul to discredit him. Right. But I'm going to show you in the Bible why they oppose Paul. Speaking of. Ishmael. Ishmael are the Arabs. This is why they oppose Paul. Let's read it real quick in the book of Galatians. Galatians four, verse number 22. Come on. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid the other by a free woman. The free mother, the, the free woman was Sarah. The bond woman is Hagar, the Egyptian who is the mother of Arabs. Read. Verse number 23. But he that, or he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh. 
but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai which generates the bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and Antrith to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Come on. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Jerusalem is above and is free. That means we're not from Africa, okay? And Mecca is not the place for worship. Read. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Go on. For it is written, Rejoice thou, barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry that thou travailest not. For the desolate have many more children than she which have an husband. Our mother had more children than all the women of the nations. Our mother Sarah. Read. 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So now he's teaching that we, the children of Israel, are the people of promise. We're the people who will, who, who will state claim or heir to the promises of Abraham. They don't teach this in the Christian church. Rightly. He's speaking of his people, Israel. Read. 29. But as then... He that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. That means the Arabs or Ishmael persecuted us. They've always persecuted us, even till this day, with their law called Islam. Paul was calling them out back then. That they are behind closed doors secretly conspiring against their little brother Isaac, whom we are. Read. Even so, it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and Cast her son. Cast out the bondwoman, Hagar, and her son, Ishmael, who's the father of Arabs. So even Paul was referencing, okay, the Old Testament against Arabs. Now, imagine him teaching this at that time while he was on earth. Read why. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. You will not get equal part in the kingdom with the children of Israel, Arabs. Okay. <laughs> now, this is written in Paul's writings. Clear. So how can Arabs become the authorities and the, and, and the imams? And the spiritual authority in the earth with, record, with records in the epistles against them like this. And this information that Paul wrote was well, was hundreds of years before there was any such man as Muhammad. So when the Muslims came on the scene looking to convert us, the children of slaves that, are, that, that were going through our diaspora, our curse, the first thing they did was, okay, these people, they believe in the Bible. They're the people of the Bible. We have to discredit their Bible. Why? Because in their book, Paul wrote that we're not going to be heirs with them. Well, if, they, if we're not heirs with them, how can we teach them? See? So that's why the Muslims want to discredit Paul, because Paul let them have it by quoting the Old Testament. And, and, and he's not just speaking of uh, uh, the modern day Arabs. He went straight to their mother. <laughs> okay. The mother of them. Kick her out and kick the son out to Ishmael. For they will not be heirs with the children of Israel. Christ gave that information to Paul to teach. Okay. Paul stood clear with that. That just because he's teaching Gentiles doesn't mean he was going to change the, uh, the mission or the good news to Israel. See? Go on. Verse 31. Yes. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman. We're not children of Hagar. Read. But of the free. But of the free. More reason why. They look to discredit Paul loosely. 
right? Go to Romans 9 real quick. Romans. Now, now, if an Arab, we're not saying an Arab can't make it. Paul wasn't saying that. Paul wasn't saying that a child of Ishmael cannot uh, uh, have a part in the kingdom. He wasn't saying that. But all nations or heathens must denounce their religions and put down their gods and serve the true God of Israel and be baptized, okay, and cleansed of the evil doings of not just them, their fathers, and accept Christ because those are the only Gentiles who will be serving in the kingdom to come. But you will not be fellow heirs, okay? You will not rule nothing in our kingdom. They didn't like that. They like the they like the authority of saying, "Well, I'm a teacher." Okay, I'm an imam. Well, only in the Gentiles' kingdom will you have authority to teach us anything. You must humble yourself. The greatest of all these nations will be servants. Okay, they don't like that, so they teach against Paul because Paul made it clear. Romans 9, come on. Romans 9 and 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. Come on. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in mine heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption. The adoption, which is, which is Christ dying on the cross. So that's us, Israelites, being adopted back into our original place. Read. And the glory. The glory is the kingdom. And the covenants. The covenants is the Old and New Testament. And the giving of the law and the service of God. The service of God being the teachers, ministers, priests of the Most High God, who are all men. Let's make that clear, too. Read. And the promises. And the promises. Whose are the fathers? Whose are the fathers? And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. According who, to the flesh, who concerning, according to the flesh, Christ came. Read. Who is over all, God blessed forever, Amon. Come on. Not as though the word of God have taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Because you're going to have Israelites who don't believe in the gospel of Christ. And the epistles and the gospels. They're only Israel in name. They will be destroyed. Okay. If they don't accept Christ and the whole word, the whole book, they will not enter into paradise. They will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Get your glory as an Israelite on this side and stand up and claim that we're the people of slaves and all that. That's the only glory you're going to receive. You will receive nothing on the other side of this. Read. Verse 7. Neither because they are of the seed of Abraham are they all children. And because why? Ishmael was the seed of Abraham. But Ishmael will not be heir with Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Guess who, guess who else out there is from the seed of Abraham? The white man. He's Esau. He's Edom. He will not be a fellow heir with us in the kingdom of heaven. He would have to de they would have to denounce all their paganism and their evil and wickedness and convert and humble themselves to Christ. Be baptized for the remission of their sins. For preparation of servitude. Once this thing is done and guess what? It's almost finished. Read on. Verse number seven. Neither because they are of the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In Ishmael? But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. As you can see, Paul distinctly went to the Old Testament being, he was, he, he was raised a Pharisee. So he knew the promises, folks. So that's why Arabs, not a non-believing religion, looks to discredit Paul. 
So the majority of the so-called contradictions of Paul that you would see people use in a day come from Muslim websites and Muslim books and all of that, that even Israelites are using because they don't even understand Paul. See, <laughs> that's why they do it. Now, there's another number two is Israelites who only believe in the law. That's why they discredit Paul, because they believe the lies the modern day Christianity is teaching. They believe that the way th check out how the Christians are teaching it, that the Israelites are no longer God's people, that if Gentiles are baptized, their fellow heirs and they're equal with Israel now, right? And there's no more God's people as it was in the Old Testament. Well, a lot of the Hebrews of the Old Testament believe those teachings, well, believe that what the Christians are teaching concerning Paul is true and reject them because of it. When the Christians are lying on Paul, okay? They're lying on Paul. Paul never said that the law was done away with. What you got, Ogaloy? Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 1. Come on. What advantage then have the Jew? What advantage then have a Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Come on. Much every way. Much every way. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Because unto Paul, or unto Israelites, excuse me, were committed the oracles of God. So he never sold his people out for Gentiles like the Gentiles are teaching, like the Christian churches are teaching, but you got a lot of unlearned Hebrews who haven't studied Paul who doesn't know this. If the Gentiles lied on us, don't you think they would lie on Paul too? <laughs> so you got our people blindly Looking to discredit Paul because they believe the Christians teachings on Paul. He never sold his people out for Gentiles. But you got a lot of Israelites who believe that because they unlearn and they wrestle with the word. And when they wrestle with the word, they also wrestle with other scriptures to their own destruction. Paul never the Paul they're teaching in the modern day Christian church. Is a different Paul. It's not the Paul of this Bible. Finish reading what you have, Elder Lloyd. Mm -hmm. Jump it down to verse 20. Yeah. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. So Paul would never teach against the law. Because it was through the law we understand the difference between Righteousness and unrighteousness, clean and unclean, right or wrong. See, read 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Yeshua the anointed unto all and upon all that believe, all them that believe. For there is no difference. When it says all that believe for there is no difference, it's speaking of God's people. There's no difference between those who know and those who don't know. We're still all the same people. So when it says there's no difference between the Jew and the Greeks, well, the Greeks, brothers and sisters, in the New Testament are to be distinguished from the Grecians. The Greeks were Hellenist. That's right. Greek speaking Jews who made Greek paganism their customs and traditions, but they were Israelites. So when it says no difference, it's not saying there's no difference between Israelites and Gentiles. See that? So I wanted to put that out there. Those Greeks in the New Testament are Israelites. And Paul was saying, well, listen, when I go to convert them back into the promise, we must accept them. Okay? If they repent for their sins and their pagan worships and put down their idolatry, we must treat them no different than the Jews or the Israelites who know they're Israelites. Okay? 
Now, hold that, elder lawyer. There's another uh, point I have here for those who became who become anti-Paul, and that's chiefly Christian women who want authority in churches. This is why you, you would have them, speaking of Christian women, pastors and all that, who shouldn't be. I don't even, I don't even know. That, that, that That's a moxie, uh, uh, oxymoron right there. A woman pastor. That's an unheard heard entity w within Scripture. But you would have those who would stand against Paul based on Paul saying what? Let's go to Timothy's real quick. First Timothy chapter two, verse nine. This is why a lot of women who want authority in the church, okay, are anti-Paul. Now, mind you, we are to define these women as Jezebel, the spirit of the devil, the female spirit of the devil, Jezebel, who want to reject Paul. Why? Because they, they want authority over men in a spiritual setting. They got they have a devil in them. OK, so they become anti Paul. Why? Let's read it. First P or first Timothy two and nine. In like manner, also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, Paul is not saying that it's against the law to wear these things, but that cannot become your glory, your beauty, where that's what you're known for. Um, opposed to your virtue. Right? Read. Verse 10. But which becometh women profess, professing godliness. So if you're going to profess godliness, what? With good works. Good works. Read. Let the woman learn in silence. Because the woman was to learn in silence. Now that's a tough deal when you go into these churches and all the noise these women are making all out of out of the pocket. Okay? So they, they, they want to act this way, but the Bible is telling them, according to Paul's writings, to be another. Read. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach. That's, that's, so especially, listen, I was raised in, in an in a, in a apostolic Pentecostal church. You hear the women three blocks before you get to the front door. So you know they, they're not feeling Paul on silence. And then on top of that, he suffered not a woman to teach. Now, is that saying that a woman cannot share the word and show others? It's not saying that. What it's saying is a woman cannot be in an authoritative position according to the administration that was given only to men. That's all it's saying. Women will begin to believe, well, OK, well, because this man, you know, is lacking in certain areas or whatever the case is, I can see this and I can do this. I'm educated. I can use my education and get a B.A. or a bachelor or a master and translate that or transfer that over into a church's position. And that's what that's what's going on now. These so-called educated women with bachelors and all that are using their street education, their worldly education to gain authority in the church and becoming ministers and pastors and all this, this mess. But Paul calls them out. So that's why they become anti-Paul. You will go to these churches and you will rarely hear these verses I'm reading read from these pastors. Read. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. So the first thing they'll go to is, what about Deborah? Mm. What about Deborah? What? So the only thing you could do is go into an Old Testament story concerning a woman that had some position. But yet in the Old Testament, you're telling us that you're not to follow the laws, statutes and commandments there. Deborah is one woman. What was the rest of the women doing in the Old Testament? <laughs> so what makes you Deborah? 
And then you have to look at who was the judges, who was the rulers, who was an authority over them. <laughs> See that? They'll go right to Deborah. Oh, Deborah and Ruth, they're, they're, any woman. And then you ask, I've spoken to some of these sisters and say, well, give me some insight on Deborah. What, how was Deborah when she was, uh, when, when she got revelation to do these things for, for the most time? How old was she? Give me her upbringing. Where, where was she born? They don't know nothing about Deborah. All they know, it's a woman that has some status biblically. <laughs> right? But the reason they go against Paul, because Paul is telling them, telling the women that you are out of order in the Most High's house. And you're making it where men of, you're in the way. You're saying that there's not enough men to do this, that, and the other. Well, get out of those men positions and see who, and then let the men know that those positions are available. Step back, step out. And let the man lead. So they become anti-Paul. And they, well, it's not enough men. That's why, no. You know why there's no men in the, your churches? Because they walk in your churches and there's nothing but a bunch of out of order women. It was one time a man used to go to church to find a good woman. Not now. Because women have taken over. So that's why women have become anti-Paul in the church. Because Paul is against their positions. He's, begin he's against their mouth up in the church. See? Read. Verse or the rest of verse 12. Come on. Nor to usurp authority over the man. Nor to, to usurp authority over the man. Read. But to be in silence. But to be totally quiet. Can you imagine? I can't imagine a black church I would walk into and there's total silence. Who's rolling over the floor? Who's making the loudest noise? Who's shaking? Who's out of order? Who's dancing in the pews? Read. 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. So now Paul is putting things in order. You cannot be out of order. Out of order is what brought sin in the earth. Adam was first formed, then Eve. Read. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. So they, so, so the sisters will read this who want authority. And then they'll begin to label Paul anti-woman. Mm. That's why they don't want to receive Paul's writings or Paul is misunderstood with them. Right. So but but a virtuous woman would look at Paul's writing and find merit merit to it. They'll look at it and say, you know what? I've been acting out. <laughs> OK. Let me repent from this and step back, humble myself so that the men of the Most High can take place, can take their rightful place. No longer will I complain about what men are not doing. Why? Because now I don't have to complain. I'm not in their way. I'm going to step back. I'm not going to become a pastor preacher, deacon. I'm not going to become an assistant minister. I'm going to step all the way back and let the men fill these voids because these positions are not for women. Read. Verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. This is how a woman shall be saved. She should be thinking about nurturing the house, taking care of our children. Looking out that way. That's her spiritual duty according to the Most High. Read. If they continue in faith and charity and in, in holiness and sobriety. If they continue in what? If they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. With sobriety. That means being in a sound mind. Following. 
listen to me clearly here, following the ministry that was set up by Christ, having men in lead positions. See? And that transfer over to the home. A man is supposed to be a man of the most high and she's, she is supposed to listen and follow that man of the most high. And if there's no man, because there's a lot of single women, well, okay. If you're in a church, okay, follow the direction of the administration in the church that are set up by men. Right? So a lot of women in the church don't like Paul's writings because they feel Paul is anti-woman. He's not anti-woman. He's he's pro-order. Okay? It's about order. It has always been about order. The last piece. The Gentiles who misunderstand Paul. The Gentiles misunderstand Paul. See, Gentiles, the, the other nations, last but not least, you've been lied to. You were taught that the Most High did away with his people and got a new people called Gentiles. And all you have to do is love Christ, and that makes you equal with the chosen people of the Old Testament. You've been lied to. They've used scriptures like this. Let's go to John real quick. John, the first chapter. John chapter one, verse 11. Yes. He came unto his own and his own received him not. So they teach in the Christian churches, this Gentile ministry, this doctrine, that he came unto his own, which are Israelites, and his own who are Israelites received him not. Right? But let's preference this. Where does it say right here at this time that he came to anyone else outside of Israel? It doesn't. So we must emphasize the word own. No one else is being preferenced in this verse. He came unto his own, his own are Israel. And it says his own, who are Israel, received him not. Read. Verse 12. But as many as received him. But as many as received him out of his what? Out of his own. See that? I'm reading John, the first chapter. The ministry to the Gentiles didn't begin until after Christ's death. So at this time, there was no ministry to Gentiles. So when it says he came unto his own and his own received them not, it's speaking of those who opposed him, who gave him up, like the Pharisees, scribes, those that weren't baptized, those that went against him. But as many as received him, like who? The 12 disciples. They, did, they received him and they were Israelites. The 120 under them. The 3,000 souls that were baptized in the book of Acts, they received them. These were all Israelites. See, the Gentiles make a mistake when they see these ambiguous words like all, many. That doesn't, uh, uh, that doesn't translate to everybody. Okay, so you must deal with the scriptures in its proper context okay again let me read this he came unto his own and his own received him not right but as many out of his own received him read to them gave he power to become the sons of god he gave those power those who are under christ he gave them now power read to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Even to them that believe in his name. Gentiles are getting this verse wrong. Now they're saying as many is everybody that believe 
on Christ's name, not rightly dividing the word of truth. There's a ministry to the Israelites and there's a ministry to the Gentiles. Okay. They, they are, they are dis two distinct ministries because the Israelites would receive the, uh, the covenant of Abraham to one day be heirs of the kingdom to rule it under Christ. The Gentiles would be on the outer courts serving that kingdom. So th those Gentiles were taught by Paul on how to fill those parts of the kingdom, the Gentile part, not the Israelite part. <laughs> Seems quite simple, right? Quite simple. Now, because of time, I'm not able to finish this fully, but let's go and prove that, that, that as many and John 1 are Israelites. St. John chapter 8, verse 30 through 31. Come on. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then Hold up. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Yeshua to those Jews which believed on him. To who? Those Jews which believed on those him. Those who? Those Jews which believed on because him. Because Christians, Christians are erroneously taught. They're taught that all, all Israelites in the Bible rejected Christ, or all of the Jews rejected Christ, so he turned his back on them and accepted all people equally. That's false doctrine. It's not biblical. Okay? And Paul clears that up in the book of Romans. Romans 11. So when it says there's no difference, when Paul says there's no difference, he's talking about in judgment. He's not saying in promise there's no difference. In judgment, there's no difference. That means if an Israelite do right, according to the Most High, he is to receive the reward for his action, his actions. If he if he do wrong, he will receive the judgment for his actions. The same with the Gentile. The Most High is no respect of persons in judgment. But when it comes to promise, it's not a promise if it's everybody's. That takes away from what defined or, or, or the meaning of promise. If he promises to Abraham in a specific seed, how could it now be for everyone? Doesn't make any sense. The Gentiles will play their part in the kingdom and the Israelite will play theirs and both will be under Christ. Right? Let's end it with this. Romans 11. Romans 11 and 1. Come on. I say then. Have God cast away his people? God forbid. Read. For I am also an Israelite. Hold up. Did Paul, Paul says what? Have God cast away his people? God forbid. That means, this is what the Christians are teaching, that Paul did away with his people and got a new people called Gentiles. That's how they are misunderstanding Paul. God forbid. Read. For I am also an Israelite. Because Paul is an Israelite. Of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Read. God have not cast away his people which he foreknew. That's a lie claiming that the Israelites are done away with. Paul make it clear. I have not, he did have not cast away his people which he foreknew in the Old Testament. Who are they? Israelites. Who are we? Israelites. You understand? So again, for you Gentiles, in order for you to understand Paul, you must be taught by the same people. You must receive the ministry by those people of the Bible, the children of Israel. You misunderstand Paul. Okay? 
Now, there's more I would like to go into, but I'm sure I will cover that. Some of this, a lot of it will be covered in this coming academy. I wanted to do a class setting to show you how we deal with the precepts, go into breaking down different facets of scripture to give total understanding. And I did this today with the Gathering of Christ Church Hebrew and Bible Academy banner behind me today. It's one thing to do the Sabbath lessons. It's another thing to do class lessons. Okay. And that's what I wanted to uh, give an example of on this Sabbath. A matter of fact, in matter of fact, in two weeks, June 24th begins a brand new Hebrew and Bible Academy. Okay, we're going to go into, you got it. We're going into uh, the creation of the universe like we've never gone into it before. Okay, also the Apostles Doctrine, the fall of the gods, the judgment of the gods. Okay, we, we also going to go into exposing Islam and Judaism. It's a three month course. It's, it's not like any other class you would normally attend. Okay. In these three months. Okay. On top of that, we are adding a lesson. You know what that is? The secrets of the times. So you want to be a part of this. Okay. If you want to be a part of it, go to historytimes.org. You don't want to miss this. Historytimes.org. Gathering as one at AOL.com. You can send an email. That's the number one at AOL.com. Or go to gatheringofchrist.org and enroll. Two weeks, we begin nine in the morning sharp. Okay? Nine in the morning sharp, we will begin, and it will be a great, great experience. And I want you all to attend and be a part of it. If you thought that this class was insightful, and I believe it was today for a Sabbath class, believe it or not, it gets deeper. Now, one thing I wanted to share with you all real quick before we end and pray out, brothers and sisters. About six years ago, I did a lesson on the uh, on the real Mount Sinai right at the tongue of the Red Sea. That at the very end, the wilderness, there's going to be an area in the wilderness in which our people will begin to go near the same mount at the tongue of the sea. After the New World Order uh, begin their purge against us, we will be going into this particular area, okay, that borders Saudi Arabia where Mount Sinai is. And it's written up in scripture. I'm going to go into a detailed lesson on this. Have you seen this yet, lawyer? Uh, no, sir. Check out what they're trying to do in that same area that's gated off and won't allow anyone to build there. Now, mind you, in this area, they found the 12 pillars that were set up by Moses. I mean, by Joshua and Moses and those that were under him. They found the 12 pillars for each tribe. So the pillars is where you would hold your camp, where the leaders would go for counsel over their tribe, over each particular tribe. They also found the altar, okay, where the fire came down on the golden calf. And it's the only mountain in the Middle East off of Saudi Arabia where the top of the mountain is black like smoke. So now we understand why they gated it off. They're going to try to stop entry for that time in which we as a people will be in that area. I've been to the Middle East, folks. I've been to Egypt. I've been to the Greek islands. OK. So I'm going to go into more detail in a moment, but I'm going to show you what they're planning in that area before we get an opportunity to be there, which is the tongue of the sea. Look at this.
happening in little tiny Estonia there next to Russia, and the other is happening in Saudi Arabia. And while Saudi Arabia doesn't have anyone attending the Bilderberg meeting, what they do have is Klaus Kleinfeld, the German-born guy who's also lived in the U.S., who's been on the Bilderberg steering committee for years and years and who attends every year. In the past, he's been known for being the CEO of Alcoa and of Siemens, so very big in industry and commerce and very big in data harvesting and planning for the future. You know, Siemens works with Disney World and all these high-tech places to implement basically uh, feedback data to collect individualized data sets on people as they go through these environments. And in the real world, Klaus Kleinfeld, with his ties and experience in Siemens, is now overseeing the special future city project known as NEOM, N-E-O-M, which is being set up in Saudi Arabia in a wasteland desert that hasn't been used for anything else, but is located located in a very strategic place. Neom comes from the Latin word for new, neo, and the M stands for the Arabic word future. So it's new future. And it's supposed to be exactly 33 times bigger than New York because we all know how they like their numerology. But also what they're saying about it is that this is a huge civilizational leap for humanity. It's going to be the next way we're all going to live. Everything is going to be artificial intelligence. There are going to be robots everywhere doing all kinds of things, including caretaking. I mean, if it sounds futuristic, if it sounds like it came out of a Philip K. Dick novel, it's probably going to be in this city. Yeah, they're trying to integrate all the new technologies, and they claim they're going to be the basis of the most important parts of it. And the bottom line, it's going to be the first first free trade zone that crosses international borders in the Middle East. It's a Saudi city state, but it's going to be a free trade zone and it branches out between Saudi Arabia, the tip of Egypt, and it, it kind of extends. I want y'all to see something, brothers and sisters. I said this six years ago. the most important parts of it. And the bottom line, it's going to be the first free trade zone that crosses international borders in the Middle East. It's a Saudi city state, but it's going to be a free trade zone and it branches out between. I want y'all to see right here, brothers and sisters, at the corner of here. That's where our forefathers crossed when the Egyptian army was coming against us. We went into this wilderness where this mountain is, and this mountain is where Mount Sinai is, folks. This is where they're building, or claiming they're building a new city. And it's not Saudi Arabia. It's Israel. They're using Saudi Arabia as the cover. Okay. I visited on the other side of here, Sham Al Sheikh, about seven years ago, about I mean, about nine years ago, I was in Sharm El Sheikh right here. Hargada is not too far on the other side, but this is the side they won't let nobody build. Right? Let me go here again. Look at it now. West, who's been on the Bilderberg Steering Committee for years and years and who attends every year. In the past, he's been known for being the CEO of Alcoa and of Siemens, so very big in industry and commerce and very big in data harvesting and planning for the future. You know, Siemens works with Disney World and all these high-tech places to implement basically uh, feedback data to collect individualized data sets on people as they go through these environments. And in the real world, Klaus Kleinfeld, with his ties and experience in Siemens, is now overseeing the special future city project known as NEOM, N-E-O-M, which is being set up in Saudi Arabia in a wasteland desert that hasn't been used for anything else, but is located in a very strategic place. NEOM comes from the Latin word for new, NEO, and the... Now, I'm going to do a complete lesson on this, but in a nutshell, brothers and sisters, that is the cover story for why they one moment, the streaming went out, one moment. Let me break this down for you, brothers and sisters. I'm going to go into this at a later date, but that's the cover story for why they're there. That's, that's the cloud of smoke 
that they use it to do something else. Okay. Number one thing they're doing is, is through some type of international public domain after setting up what you would call a government in Israel. Now they're staking claim to certain areas, biblical areas that have spiritual significance for us. So the cloud is we're going to buy some of this area to build a city, but they're going to have what claim to who enter this particular area one way or the other. They're going to say, well, listen, we got the paperwork. We this is ours. Mm. So that they can preclude anyone from actually crossing in over into there during the final purge. It's just a cover. I'm going to go into a detailed lesson on this soon. But they did something like this before. Years ago in the 70s, they allowed Benai Me to go into Demona, Israel. Now, they could care less about Demona, Israel, because Demona, Israel... They, they weren't originally letting black people back there at all, but they kind of figured, okay, we got these crackpots. That's what they were. Claiming that they got a Messiah and all that. So we're going to kill two birds with one stone. We're going to let them through to make, make everyone believe we're doing something for black people. But this guy was dealing with all types of false, uh, what you would call esoteric satanic doctrine. And even allowed his people to join the Israeli military. But the real cover for Demona had nothing to do with black people coming back to Israel. It was a cover because why? Israel wasn't agreeing to the Nuclear Prol Prol Proliferation Act. And everyone knew that they were building nuclear missiles, them in America together in Israel. So to hide what they were doing, they let black people come and build huts over there claiming that they're building, bringing black people back. And it was a cover for Israel building their nuclear arsenal. So what they claim it's for is usually a cover. Nothing happened with that Demona thing. Okay. Ben Ami claimed to be Christ and was doing all types of madness on that compound backed by the Jewish people. They didn't care what black people were doing there as long as the black people acted as a cover for their nuclear buildup. Same thing going on here. Okay, at Mount Sinai. It's a cover for the future. And I'm going to be going into that in a future lesson. Shalawam, I'll answer questions for five minutes, then we'll wish you all God speed. Let me stream up anywhere. Let me get it here. Oh, I wanted to say this also that, um, they're going to be changing uh, Ustream starting August 1st. They're going to try to cut off the plan that we have for our weekly Sabbaths. So keep your ear to the ground or gather or go to gatheringchrist.org. We'll be sending you details or giving you the updates on our next place for a platform. Even if we have to make a platform where we stream exclusively through our server online, we'll do so. OK, so we're working on that now because Ustream have been bought out uh, through IBM and they're now trying to purge or really censor those with free thought outside of mainstream. OK, so eventually this platform on the Sabbath will change from Ustream to another place, but not without us uh, informing you. OK. All right. All right, uh, the Q&As are open.
Okay. Uh, Rod Tazakwa. Shalom, Elder. My question is about tithing. I am a retired military and receive three types of income. Retirement, disability, and from the army, and Social Security. Do I pay tithes? Well, you don't break down where, where it comes from. Okay, it's not a breakdown. What you receive all together, 10% of that is tithing. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Okay, the same way when you look at the slaughter of the kings under Melchizedek with Abram, because that's where the uh, tithing was established, not in Levi. Okay, it was established under the orders of Melchizedek, and Christ came in that order. OK, now it wasn't like one of the kings he had to pay the 10 percent from or the other king that was destroyed, which were different income from different takedowns. All of it together, he gave a tenth of all when you read the scriptures. So it's not itemizing where the 10 percent comes from. Whatever one received, 10 percent of that go towards the ministry. OK, and I know you have these different doctrines out there claiming that you give according to what you can and all that. That's the new law. That's another misconception of people using Paul's writings for their own uh, uh, doctrinal cause. OK, Paul never said not to pay tithe. OK. Tithing is in the law. OK. Now, you have tithing and you have free will offerings in the law. The tithings are sustained regardless of your free will offering. Given as you have the opportunity to is under free will offering. Uh, Jacques Kadar, Acts 13 and 1, it says there were certain prophets that were called Niger. How can we make a conclusion that all were black? When the scriptures say certain ones only, good question. Well, we can't make an assumption. We can say for sure there's no scripture that says that they were white. You don't have to assume anything. Okay. There's not one scripture that said that they were white. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's next? But we have scripture that says that they were neither. Okay. Uh, I am Judah. Shalawam. Document that Elder Gabar have with. You introduced that in the academy coming up. Of course, we're going to introduce the doc, the document in papyrus showing you that Christ was called the savior by disciples. That was the name given to the disciples to baptize him. The baptize under. We're going to show that in the academy. Absolutely. Brother Tony. Thawada elder. Uh, lawyer. Other lawyer. Ricard and other lawyer. Really love this lesson. Great precepts. Praise to the most high. All praises be to the most high. Uh, can you, do you have any uh, info on California being divided into three parts? I don't have any information on California being divided into three parts. But America, which is the modern day Babylon, will be divided into three parts. Uh, let's get Revelation 16 and 19 and then we'll pray, pray out and wish you all Godspeed. Revelation chapter 16, verse number 19. It, uh, and the great city was divided into three parts. And that, let's go before that. Verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. There was a great earthquake. Such as was not since men were upon earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. 
And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before the Most High to give unto her the cup of her wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So it's going to be an earthquake, and, and, and as a result of that earthquake, it will be parted into three places. Keep your eye on Yellowstone. Things have already begun underground. You have volcanoes erupting. All of that's happening right now. You have them fracking, which really the fracking started during the gold rush of California. They was digging mines, and that started a lot of the earthquakes over there. But now they've digged all the way from the west coast and fracked all the way to the east coast. And there will be an earthquake that will part America, the modern day Babylon, into three places. But of course, the Most High will give us ample time to flee from the pearls and persecution to come within America. And that's the ministry we'll be teaching this year throughout the earth on the corners within all the cities of America before it's time to go. Shalom, may the Most High be with you. His name is Ahaya, Baha'i Shem Yishaya, where we walk. We pray that the Most High protect you and your families. Stay prayed up and sin not. Shalom. Shalom.